Good afternoon and welcome to all those tuning in to the American Council of Trustees and Alumni webinar, Defending Free Expression and Intellectual Diversity, What Trustees Need to Know. My name is Nick Down and I am ACT as Senior Program Officer in our Trustee and Government Affairs Department. Before we begin, I would like to highlight a few housekeeping items. First, today's program will run for approximately 60 minutes. We expect to end the discussion with time for our panelists to answer questions from the audience. To submit questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A box uh, and also include your name and institution you are affiliated with. And finally, today's webinar is being recorded and will be sent to everyone and posted on www.goacta.org afterwards. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's panelists and moderator. First, we have Marty Kodis. Mr. Kodis is currently an active and engaged trustee at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, who has been a leader on a number of initiatives during his time on the board and during his time previously serving on the UNC Board of Governors. Marty is the CEO and owner of Kick-Ass Concepts, a commercial real estate developer managing properties in North and South Carolina. Next, we have Dr. Eric Smith. Dr. Smith is an Associate Professor of Rhetoric and Composition at York College of Pennsylvania, and is also one of the founders of Free Black Thought, a website and journal dedicated to spotlighting viewpoint diversity among Black intellectuals. Professor Smith became a leader in the academic freedom movement when he argued that a keynote address, or address delivered at a, at a conference in his discipline exhibited the kind of performative politics that fails to affect real change and challenge the speaker's claim that teaching standardized English to students of color is an act of white supremacy. Next, we have Dr. Abigail Thompson. Dr. Thompson is a distinguished professor of mathematics at the University of California uh, and a co-founder of the Association for Mathematical Research. In a 2019 op-ed for the Wall Street Journal entitled The University's New Loyalty Oath, she criticized the UC system's new hiring process for privileging certain intellectual viewpoints over others, a violation of the university's stand against McCarthy-era loyalty oaths. Our last panelist today, uh, Karen Taylor Robson. Ms. Taylor Robson is founder and president of Arizona Strategies, a premier land use strategy firm based in Phoenix. In June 2017, she was appointed by Governor Doug Ducey to the Arizona Board of Regents, where she helped launch the Regents Cup, a debate competition for students at Arizona public universities that promote rigorous, respectful discourse and celebrates free speech and democratic engagement. Ms. Taylor Robson also joined ACT as Board of Directors earlier this year. And finally, we have our moderator, Dr. Stephen McGuire. Dr. McGuire is act as Paul and Karen Levy Fellow on Campus Freedom, where he leads the organization's Campus Freedom Initiative. He frequently, frequently writes and speaks on free speech and academic freedom in the context of contemporary campus issues. Prior to joining ACTA, Dr. McGuire was director of the Matthew J. Ryan Center for the Study of Free Institutions and the Public Good and associate teaching professor in the Augustine and Culture seminar program at Villanova University. Now that introductions are out of the way, I'm going to stop talking and let Steve take it from here. Steve, good afternoon and please take it away. Great, thanks very much, Nick. And thanks again to our panelists for joining us today. And also uh, good afternoon to all of you that have tuned in. Uh, thank you for being with us. Before turning to asking the first question of the panelists, I, I just wanna highlight ACTA's Campus Freedom Initiative, uh, which I lead, and specifically uh, the backbone of that project, which is our gold standard for freedom of expression. The gold standard's a 20-point plan that we've developed at ACTA uh, that includes policies and practices that colleges and universities can implement to promote a culture of free expression on their campuses. Uh, and it includes many things that uh, trustees can be uh, involved in doing. Uh, one example would be adopting the Chicago principles. Uh, another would be the, uh, the, the Calvin report on uh, institutional neutrality, uh, but many other things as well. Hiring practices, 
Uh, you can ask about including free expression uh, training or education in new student orientation. Um, you know, there's there's 20 different things. So I encourage everybody uh, to have a look at that uh, after we're done here today. Having mentioned that, uh, I'd like to turn to our panelists and uh, I'm gonna proceed with sort of three general topics. First, I'd like to ask them to talk about why free expression and intellectual diversity are important and, and what the challenges are uh, for those things on America's campuses today. Then we'll talk about some of the things that can be done to promote and protect free expression and intellectual diversity. And then we'll try to get into some concrete recommendations or ideas for how trustees can affect positive change on their campuses. And of course, we'll uh, try to leave plenty of time for your questions as well at the end. So let me begin. Uh, I'll start with Dr. Smith. Uh, Eric, could you talk about why you think free expression and intellectual diversity are so important in a university context? And also, what do you see as some of the uh, key challenges that are facing those things today? I think free speech or free expression is important on college campuses because it's important in society. Um, a free and you know, a liberated and civil democracy does not work without freedom of expression. Um, and I think some people know that and that's precisely why they fight back against it. Uh, they have uh, ulterior motives uh, beyond the classroom, but many people don't do it because well, they consider it violence. Now, I'd rather be insulted than shot, uh, frankly, but a lot of people are considering uh, free speech or speech in general a form of violence, and that is a problem. Uh, we need to fortify our students, for one thing. We need to um, make clear why freedom of, sp of speech is a thing in the first place, and, and we kind of, we, we need to make it cool, you know, and what I mean by that is it, it needs to be a systemic aspect of uh, any college campus. You know, there are some schools that are giving full scholarships for the debate team as if it's the football team. You know, I think that should be a trend that uh, grows throughout this society, if not America, the Western society in general, you know. Um, so that's what I like to, you know, uh, think about when dealing with censorship, kind of make it make it part of the culture and make people realize that this is nothing to be afraid of. Uh, a lot of people run from argument because they're afraid of losing the argument. They're not afraid of argument itself. Give them those tools. Give them rhetorical skills that, that instill what's called defensive confidence. You know, um, the, the uh, confidence to go into an argument knowing that you have the skills, the tools to back up your claim. Interestingly enough, the more defensive confidence one has, the more likely they are to have their minds changed because they're not running from the argument, they're running to the argument. So these are the things that I think about when presented with that question. Interesting, thank you. Uh, Abby, maybe I'll go to you next. How, you know, how do you see the importance of free expression and intellectual diversity on campus and, and what are the challenges that you see? So I, <clears throat> I wanna echo some of the things that Eric just said. He used a great word. He says, it, it needs to be fortified on campus. And I think one of the reasons for that is Actually, I think the idea of free speech and free expression is quite a difficult idea. I have always thought this. Um, if you if you speak with somebody in a different country, they're kind of puzzled by our our attention to it and our devotion to free speech. So I think it's quite a hard idea. And if we're not prepared to defend it on campus and to exercise it on campus, then it it's kind of doomed. Uh, I, I'm afraid that it's kind of doomed. In science, the idea that you should constantly challenge ideas and constantly question what is the perceived wisdom at the time is, is crucial to the whole development of, of the field. And so if, if that's squished even a little bit, it's very detrimental to the field. And finally, I would say that it's become the case on campus that arguing about controversial topics is almost forbidden. Uh, it's considered to be, as as Eric said, a form of violence to question any of the of the popular notions, uh, po particularly political notions of the day, and and that's devastating to intellectual life on campus. 
Karen, I think I saw you shaking your head there when Abby mentioned that we couldn't debate controversial ideas on campus. Uh, you know, what's your uh, reaction to that? Well, uh, well, I wasn't shaking my head in opposition. I was shaking my head thinking about all the people who are afraid of these controversial topics. So I was just lamenting the condition we're in. Yes. And, and I was shaking my head up and down because if we can't do it on campus, where can we do it? You know, we are, we, none of us are born with debate skills, right? We have to teach it. We have to nurture it. And that is really the essence of a university. You know, different ideas must come into, con you know, contact for intellectual pro progress to occur. And I often, you know, go back to the basics, go back to the fact that free speech is the first amendment to our constitution. It undergirds everything about who we are. And I believe it is the reason why America has 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 been, um, you know, the, the, the greatest country in the world when it comes to innovation over the last 250 years is because we're not afraid to throw out crazy or bad ideas. And, and throw them into the arena and test them and defend them. And, and, and we have to, to encourage and create an environment uh, for that to happen. You know, I, I often ask people who, who want to, um, you know, shut down thought or protect, protect their kids from controversial subjects. I said, you know, are we gonna take, are we gonna take the weights out of the gym? Right. You go to the gym to build resistance and resiliency and to get stronger. Uh, you know, in, in Arizona, there's a, another good example of uh, the biosphere. I don't know if anybody is familiar with the biosphere, but it was an attempt to create on Earth a, a you know, in an enclosed setting, a, you know, replicate the Earth's environment. And what they discovered is the trees that were growing in the biosphere were extremely brittle and fragile because they had no wind in the environment. You know, in the natural environment, trees have wind that create resistance, that build stronger trees. And, and so the same thing goes for intellectual diversity. We have to challenge each other and, and learn to do it in a way that advances uh, intellectual uh, curiosity and advances innovation. That's great. Now, Marty, uh, UNC has been doing uh, quite a bit in the last few months to try and shore up free expression intellectual diversity. And we'll get to some of the things that you've been doing later, but you know, you've know, you been integral to many of these efforts. Uh, why do you think it's so important to defend free expression and intellectual diversity on campus? Well, I think you only need to look at other societies around the world that don't have that, that don't have free press, that don't have freedom of expression that maybe have limited property rights. And you start thinking about what that would be like here if uh, if we you know, were in that, uh, that sort of a societally pressured government controlled environment. And so you know, we see one of the main challenges right now, just getting to the point where we can have civil discussions about various topics and not face immediate knee jerk cancel culture or shouting people down but actually talking through issues rationally. And, you know, that seems like a very low bar, but um, it, it's becoming increasingly difficult. So I think it's, it's the one life skill that if we have a student graduate from the University of North Carolina um, that they would have, I would hope they would be able to have an intellectual discussion and debate a topic without resorting to very base uh, responses and attacks to, to shout someone down or, or, um, or try and cancel them or dox them. Okay, great, thank you. So uh, let's move on to talk about what are some things that trustees can do to try and improve the conditions uh, on college campuses. And Karen, maybe I'll, I'll start with you and ask, you know, what are some of the things that, that come to mind as being at the top of the list that you think boards of trustees could do to send the message that free expression and intellectual diversity are important on a campus and that they'll be protected? Well, there's there's any number of ways to, to skin this, the cat, so to speak. And when I was appointed to the Arizona Board of Regents, uh, we, we only have three public universities in Arizona. 
which is uh, relatively unusual, but only one of our universities had a green rating from FIRE, for example. And as a new member of, board, uh, of the board, I you know, had to do my research and figure out what FIRE was and what they were about and what their rating system was about. Uh, but I you know, quickly learned, and then I made it a point to work with the other universities um, and say, why, why don't you have a green rating? And so before the end of my, my tenure on the board, all three of our universities achieved uh, a green rating. And, and while that's not the end all be all, it got people thinking and they knew that I, as a member of the board, took this seriously and, and was very committed to making sure that we you know, create an environment and, and express commitment to free speech. That being, and, and I'm, I'm very proud to say we're the only state in the nation where all of our public universities have a green rating. Uh, but but that's only the beginning, right? That's and that's a metric that you know you, it's, it's constant vigilance by members of boards of trustees to make sure that the universities are actually adhering uh, to the the commitments that they have ex- expressed. And 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 I can tell you as a, a member of the board and even now as a as a former member of the board, our work is never ever done because there there are forces at play within the you know academic environment that that simply don't want to see um, freedom of expression and intellectual diversity. And so it's just a constant battle, but, you know, things like fire uh, and and Steve has also, you know, mentioned a couple other things um, as well. You know, the adoption of the Chicago principles, which is, has become pretty, pretty standard in order to get your green fire rating rating, but it's not the only way. Um, and, And another thing that I think is, is something that trustees can encourage is um, robust efforts at new student orientation, freshman orientation. When the students arrive on campus, it is the time to have a level set on what the expectations of the institution are, what the expectations of the Board of Trustees are when it comes to civil discourse. You know, a lot of kids are coming out of high school settings where, you know, in those settings as well, they're not encouraged to, to speak up or to speak freely or to have diversity of thought. But if, you know, as members of the Board of Trustees, we can make sure that that's a requirement, that the students arrive knowing that the expectation is free and open debate and that uh, diversity of ideas and opinions are welcome. I think we'll, we would see transformational change in our students if they knew walking in the door that, that not only was it acceptable, but it was expected, um, you know, in the classroom. So that's something that uh, I, I think, and I, I have a whole list, but I'll stop with those those two items. Eric, maybe let me ask you about that idea of having students learn something about free expression or, or civil dialogue, even as part of their uh, new student orientation. Um, you know, having been a faculty member previously myself, um, you know, I think that that would potentially be a, you know, a valuable preparation for the students to have. And and I know looking at orientation programs as they exist now, they often don't include uh, that sort of thing, but it does seem like it could potentially be an important way to uh, communicate the values and the expectations of the, of the school. But what do you think? Um, well, I think there's a difference between having a, you know, a policy like the Chicago Statement and having the spirit of the Chicago Statement throughout the college. I think the latter is the one that is is missing and that we need to deal with. Orientation is great, it's a great place to do this, but it has to keep going after the orientation. Uh, Like I said earlier, it has to be systemic, right? Um, The students have to, I'll say this, uh, the saying, you know, uh, calm seas don't make good sailors, right? Each college has to be a rough sea. That, That should be what we're striving for. There should be a, you know, the perfect storm, you know, uh, on every college campus, right? To, to give them the opportunities to see for themselves that a challenge is not necessarily uh, something to run away from. It can be something to run toward. It can be something that can enhance innovation. It can be something that can open one's mind in ways that uh, it wouldn't have been open otherwise. Lastly, I think professors need to model this. You know, um, you know, uh, normal semesterly or bi-semesterly debates between uh, professors uh, who, who model this civility and who model the appreciation for the debate, even if they lose, right? 
that is imperative. Even if they lose, like I said before, people aren't afraid of arguments. They're afraid of losing the arguments. So if they can see the skills that better ensure that you win an argument and the kind of attitude you can have, even if you lose the argument, I think that could go a long way. Great. Marty, uh, let me turn to you. I, I mentioned earlier, you guys have done several things uh, at UNC in the last several months, but uh, maybe you could just give us a general idea of what you think some of the most important things that a member uh, or let's say a board of trustees could do uh, to promote free expression on campus. Sure. I, I think some of the easier ones to go through would be uh, Chicago principles, Calvin report, um, the banning of compelled speech. Um, then you've got kind of next steps of things like uh, our school of civic life and leadership uh, program for public discourse. You know, I'm hopeful that soon we will be tackling even more in freshman orientation um, and uh, with a, uh, kind of student debate programs, encouraging that, uh, making sure you've got uh, non-discrimination policies. Uh, those are all the different ones that are getting kind of knocked around these days on campuses. So I think that's the that's what we're spotting. But to Eric's point, I think the other critical thing is we've got to make sure these policies are being followed. Uh, and that probably means using your audit um, departments or audit committees or your different uh, schools to make sure that the policies are being followed. Yeah, could you tell us a little bit more about the new school and the and the debate program? Sure, yeah. So the program for public discourse has been around for a, a while, um, but the, um, the School for Civic Life and Leadership uh, was something that the university developed. It you know, really dates back to ideas and action and Again, kind of an outgrowth of uh, that and the program for public discourse. Uh, we passed a resolution earlier this year, really just uh, encouraging the acceleration of that school, uh, moving that forward a little bit faster and helping to find funds, which our legislature uh, generously provided uh, for that school. Um, but the, the whole goal of it is really just encouraging people to have a reasonable debate and dialogue and letting people know their different opinions. And uh, it's okay to have a different opinion. It's okay to disagree and uh, how to do that in a productive manner. Mm -hmm. And so that will, that will hopefully impact uh, various programs throughout the school, as well as uh, be a, a, a degree program also to allow people to kind of uh, uh, focus on that concept and move that uh, forward. But um, we hope to have, um, you know, our initial staff in place relatively soon and, uh, and move that program forward. There's a lot of other uh, universities now that uh, are doing similar things. So I think we're all competing for uh, the same labor pool too. Yeah, I want to come back to Karen in a moment because uh, they, of course, have the School for Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership at uh, Arizona State University. And I'd also like to have her talk a little bit about the uh, the Regents Cup, uh, the Regents Cup. But first, let me uh, go to Abby and ask Abby, you know, you know, based on what you've heard here or, or other experiences you had, you know, what are things that you you think would be helpful, you know, from a board level in terms of trying to improve conditions on campus? So. I'm not going to, I'm, people have had some great suggestions, the Chicago um, principles, the Calvin report, that would be fantastic. It would be a miracle if they were adopted in California, um, <laughs> but it would be a miracle I would appreciate very, very much. Um, a couple of things that I feel like haven't been mentioned. One is something that I don't know that much about, but the whole issue of accreditation is a problem. And it is something I believe that is in the trustees ballpark to deal with. Uh, but we are sometimes, I would say, frequently hit with the cudgel of you must do this because otherwise there's an accreditation problem. And so the accreditation agencies and how they operate, I think, is an issue that the trustees need to consider. Um, Marty touched on the issue of compelled speech. From my point of view, requiring uh, DEI statements for faculty hiring and promotion is compelled speech. And if we were able to eliminate those in California, I would be very excited. I think something that people might not realize is the 
extreme extent to which they're used in, in California. So for example, there's an assistant professor of applied math position at the uh, UC Santa Cruz. And the, the position states initial screening will be based on DEI statements. This doesn't mean that the faculty get to see the whole file and then have to look at that statement in particular. The administration controls the entire process. They can and do only release those statements to the search committee until an initial screening has been made. So it's pretty extreme. And then the last thing that I'd like to mention that I really feel that the trustees could have a big impact on is exactly how are senior administrators at the universities being recruited and hired? Because it's quite an interesting process. It bypasses a lot of the requirements for faculty searches uh, um, in, on our campuses. Most, if not all, of these senior administrator positions are being funneled through executive search firms. And the instructions that those search firms are given are opaque. The pools that they are developing are opaque, and the results that we're getting are pretty pathetic. So typically faculty are presented with, you know, these are the four finalists for Dean. Uh, you get to go hear them and you rank them from bad to worse, and you usually <laughs> get the worst, in fact, of the very few that the faculty are ever aware of. So I think that administrative hiring is a, is a significant issue. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, so, Karen, uh, like I said, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts. Of course, like I mentioned, there's the there's Skettle at ASU. Uh, the, I'd like to hear a little bit about the Regents Cup, uh, diversity statements, you know, probably plenty of things you'd like to talk about. Yeah, well, well, we'll start with Skettle, the School for Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership, which was was really a, a um, result of our previous governor's efforts to fund it and, and find faculty. And, and Marty, um, I'll, I'll tell you what, our, our success is, is, uh, is bringing some challenges because schools such as yours in North Carolina now are poaching our, our faculty. But uh, that, just, that just suggests we need a bigger pool of uh, faculty that are committed to, to uh, diversity of, of thought. Um, but I guess, you know, it, it's a good problem that, that we now have. But, um, you know, I, I've got to, I want to touch on the Regents Cup, but I'll do that. I'll do that after we talk about the diversity statements. Um, and, and Steve and I should be doing a, a little victory lap today um, because we, we penned a, a, an op-ed in the Arizona paper calling out our state's universities and their requirements of the diversity statements, which are, you know, essentially an ideological litmus test. Um, it, it, I received immediate reaction from a couple of our university presidents. Um, you know, they, they committed to removing these, these requirements for hiring. Um, and, and as a result, in part of that op-ed, uh, as well as some really good work done by the Goldwater Institute on the same subject, uh, the board announced, and it was reported in the paper yesterday, that they are eliminating um, this requirement. Uh, it goes back to what I talked about earlier is this is just a start. You know, you can't you can't take your foot off the pedal because even though they say they're doing it and we have reason to believe they will, it's my belief they'll just find another way to get around it. So it's just diligence on the part of trustees to make sure that the intention of the board is is actually fulfilled at the end of the day. So it's a it's our work is never done. But uh, don't despair as, as trustees, you just have to keep, keep at it, keep going forward. Uh, and, and depending on your university's presidents, um, I have found, at least in my experience, that you know, the, the presidents and the faculty are obvious, you know, are not always on the same page. And, and you know, I believe that there are presidents out there that you know, they, they're swimming with alligators, so to speak. Um, every day. And, and so the trustees can play a unique role and, you know, I don't know how else to put this, but providing some cover for the presidents where, you know, the board, if they're clear in their um, intentions on free speech, the diversity statements or whatever, if we're clear, the, the president's jobs depend on them following our lead. 
And so you give them the, the cover, so to speak, to tell the faculty and, and, and really have an impact on hiring decisions and what, what takes place in the classroom. And I, I think that's a critical role for trustees to play. So Steve also mentioned the Regents Cup. It, uh, when I was uh, first appointed to the Board of Regents, and I, I was drinking from the fire hose because it was not something I, I had anticipated. And uh, discovered pretty quickly that we have a problem when it comes to free speech and civil discourse on our campuses. And Arizona State University is the largest largest university in the country. And so I said, okay, uh, while while it's not perfect, ASU is doing pretty pretty well. And so we have a responsibility and an opportunity to model not only for Arizona but model for the nation uh, what good robust debate looks like. And so in Arizona, we have in football, the Territorial Cup, which is one of the oldest or football rivalries in the nation. And so I said, OK, much like the Territorial Cup is, I want a debate competition among our three universities. We'll call it the Regents Cup. Uh, each university will gather their, their, their best debaters. Um, the students end up in a, in a semester long class where they get credit uh, and it culminates in, in the, the Regents Cup competition. Um, I had, you know, multiple goals in, in, in conceiving of it, obviously to teach our kids how to debate, to model that, that a diversity of ideas is important. And what makes the Regents Cup very different from most debates is each and every year, it will be focused on free speech and the First Amendment. It's not going to be, you know, immigration or abortion or whatever the topic du jour is. It is to get the, the students to really dive into the First Amendment, the free exchange of ideas, and how and why it is so important uh, to our to our country, and, you know, our country's past as well as as our country's future. So it, it has grown each year. Um, one of my ulterior motives was to pull the business community into it, as well as uh, the elected officials. And so each year we've had you know, members of our legislature, members of, of the judiciary members of the business community all pulled in as sponsors and judges so that it, it brings them into the university, it creates stickiness and connectivity, and, and it's been very successful. So uh, this year, uh, we have, we, we've, we, we got the resources necessary to launch a national Regents Cup competition. Uh, and, and we anticipate in late 24 or, or spring semester of 25, to have a national competition uh, in DC, and, and the hope is to gather as many universities um, that would be interested and uh, come together and celebrate free speech and celebrate uh, the learned skills of, of our students um, and, and just really promote civil discourse all around. So That's that was fantastic. probably too long winded, but. <laughs> No, it yeah. sounds it sounds fantastic. Thank you for sharing, uh, Eric. I was going to say, as a rhetorician, this must sound like music to your ears. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it's so meta. A debate about the benefits of debate. Mind blown. <laughs> I love this idea. And uh, yeah, don't forget about me when you're putting this together. I would love to help in any way. Awesome. Eric, let me ask you, too, about uh, diversity statements, uh, which have been mentioned a couple of times from a faculty perspective. Uh, what you know. At ACTA, this is one of the things we suggest in our gold standard, uh, you know, is that these sorts of uh, ideological tests for getting hired as a faculty member be removed. But, you know, one of the questions I hear from time to time is like, well, what's the big deal here? I mean, don't we want professors who are going to, say, create a welcoming environment uh, in the classroom, right? Or you, you want to know that you're hiring people who aren't going to discriminate against people because of their background or their their race or their sex or, or, or what have you. Um, but, you know, from your perspective as a faculty member, you know, what's sort of your evaluation of this idea of using diversity statements in, in hiring or they're even sometimes used in the tenure and promotion process? The problem with diversity statements is the lack of diversity. You know, there, there are many ways to create a comfortable environment and to respect difference and things like that. But typically diversity statements are looking for one particular way of doing that. Um, and, and well, I won't go into the origins of that way, but, but the point is um, if I wrote a diversity statement, you know, um, it would be rejected, right? 
um, because I'm abiding by some, you know, traditionally classical liberal values. And I say all the time that classical liberalism is diversity if you do it right. We weren't doing it right for a couple of hundred years. Um, so I would lean on that. Equality, uh, viewpoint diversity, primacy of reason, right? Um, listening, having everybody have a voice, right? These are the kind of things I would emphasize, but I'll also emphasize the, the celebration of different cultures and, and, and acknowledging the contributions of different cultures. Um, that's not enough for a lot of people. So I understand, you know, writing about, you know, the importance of diversity, but that needs to be diverse as well. Great, thank you. And I, I should point out that uh, Abigail wrote a now fairly famous piece for the Wall Street Journal on uh, diversity statements. Uh, I believe you called them the uh, the new loyalty oaths. Is that right, Abby? Yeah, that was it. <laughs> okay, well, let's move on um, to the sort of third point of discussion, which is maybe getting into some more concrete ideas. I, I think, you know, trustees listening uh, to us talk so far, uh, you know, hopefully they're wondering now, you know, well, what are some actual concrete steps that I could take to do some of these things? You know, how, how do you actually go about getting them done. And, uh, you know, I, I think when people get appointed to a board, um, you know, they might not always be fully aware of like, well, what are my, uh, what are my responsibilities? What are my powers? You know, what sorts of things can I do? Um, and so, you know, maybe Marty, we'll, we'll start with you. Um, I believe you joined the UNC board in, in 2001. Is, is that correct? I joined the um, Board of Governors in 2013 and served there for eight years and then the Board of Trustees in 2021. Okay, good. So you were already a seasoned expert by the time you joined the Board of Trustees. <laughs> <laughs> well, could you maybe- uh, By any means, there's a lot of uh, information to take in. <laughs> sure, yeah. So could you maybe give us a couple of, uh, you know, maybe pick one thing uh, or give us a couple of examples, you know, how did you decide, or you and your other board members, you know, how do you decide like, okay, here's something we should do something about, you know, here's something we could do to maybe help with that. Like, how do you concretely approach uh, affecting some positive change on your campus? I, I think it's listening to the people of North Carolina and uh, hearing what their concerns are. You know, we forget sometimes that the, University is owned by the people of the state. We're just, uh, you know, and our job is to provide the benefits of the university to those, uh, to the people of the state. So listening to them, hearing concerns, and then identifying any problems that are out there and thinking of practical solutions, I can tell you it's been a great help uh, working with ACTA and the Martin Center, uh, both with a wealth of knowledge, a lot of different perspectives. Uh, and having a chance to you know, get data from, uh, from those groups as well as FIRE, uh, and then start picking challenges or problems and trying to address them. You know, we, on the free speech front, like I said, we you know, tackled that with the Chicago principles. Uh, we dealt with institutional neutrality with the Calvin Statement. Uh, we've done things like uh, audit uh, campus tours and admissions questions. Um, we've looked for things that are political litmus test or litmus test out there for viewpoints uh, so that we aren't forcing people to adhere to an ideology. You know, we don't want to see a return to the uh, McCarthy uh, era. And, uh, you know, and, and I don't want to enforce my conservative views, let's say, on someone else either. So you know, I think that's whenever you're thinking about free speech or controls or government control, I just think you have to imagine giving that control to your enemy or your, um, you, you know, if you're being intellectually honest, you don't want free speech taken away from people because that's a, that's a really awful uh, tool that could change society. Um, you know, we're just kind of working through different, different topics that come up and different issues in addition to things like working on the finances of the university and how programs are funded and, discussions about uh, class schedules and uh, athletics and everything else. So this is just one part of uh, what we're discussing on a regular basis. Okay, great. Uh, Karen, how about you? Uh, you know, when you joined the Board of Regents, you know, how did you go about deciding what you were going to 
work on and how you were going to try and get things done? Well, you know, that that's a that's a tough question because as the trustees know, the depth and breadth of issues that members of the board have to deal with is pretty daunting. And so you, you really do have to pick and choose. Uh, and, and the free speech issue was at the top of my, my passion list, so to speak. I was appointed to the board because of my real estate background, and we've got pretty significant real estate holdings, but my passion was free speech and the First Amendment. Um, and, and part and partial of that uh, led me to a review of our general education requirements. Um, and I would just suggest to all trustees that they that, that you look at the general education requirements at your respective universities, because I discovered pretty quickly that we had zero requirements for American history or American government or any any requirement to understand our you know constitutional system. Uh, that's changed. We it, it it took us a couple of years and a lot of iterations. Uh, but but that's now a requirement, and 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 I believe having some understanding of our constitutional republic uh, and the First Amendment in the context of that is critical. And and I was shocked to learn that our universities didn't have that requirement. And so I would I would assume that many other trustees may be shocked to learn that as well. And so I would encourage everybody, you know, as a starting point to to look there. And then, of course, we've talked about a lot of, of these things already from the Chicago principles to the Calvin report or maybe adopting a policy on institutional neutrality, um, you know, dealing with you know, actionable issues in, in orientation to require certain things to be outcomes of the orientation, um, even going so far as, uh, you know, I think it was at Princeton, Keith Whittington wrote a book called Speak Freely that was then uh, required reading for every every freshman coming in the door. And so there are, there's any number of things that a trustee can do um, uh, to ensure that, that when these students walk in the door, uh, they understand that they're gonna learn uh, uh, about a lot of things that they might not agree with, but they're gonna end up walking out the door with the, the skills uh, that they need to, to compete and succeed in a, in a society that, that should value a diversity of ideas, but it, it starts with the trustees. If we don't do it, who's going to do it? And so, you know, step up, stand up and, you know, like, like Marty did at, at North Carolina and, and I'm sure others, you know, listening in have already done, but just stand up and do it. It's, you know, it's, you have to, that's, that's our job. Thanks. Yeah. One thing I wanted to go back to, too, uh, Abby had raised the issue of uh, accreditation and how, you know, the requirements of accreditors can be used as a sort of a reason to compel faculty, I guess, to do certain kinds of things or to go along with certain kinds of things. Is that right, Abby? Yeah, it's it's we we must do hiring this way or we are risking blah. That's with with respect to, to accreditors. Um, can, can I go back to, I, I would like to go back to something Eric said at the beginning of when freshman orientation, including free speech was raised, which I think is a fantastic idea, but he said something like great idea, but we need that spirit throughout the university. It's not, it's not enough just to have a freshman or we need the spirit. And from my point of view, the difficulty with exactly that, getting the spirit through the university is that university leadership, at least in California, is in lockstep, essentially opposed to everything that we've been discussing. Uh, so their, their devotion to diversity just displays absolute conformity, and they don't like it. Intellect, if you use the word intellectual diversity here in a diversity statement, for example, that would basically get it thrown out. Um, so I think the, the issue of what university leadership is doing, and I don't mean the trustees here, I mean the senior administrators, the presidents, the chancellors, um, and, and how, they, how they are achieving this astonishing conformity is something that the trustees really need to start looking at. Eric, I think I saw you raising your hand there. Um, I just have a question. Um, with the administrators who are running the show, um, for whose sake are they doing it? When they talk about diversity and conformity and things like that, who are they benefiting? Who are they saving? 
um, they, they're they're benefiting themselves primarily. I think the way senior administrators work at the moment is they they go to a place as as a vice provost for five years. They make a lot of nice noises and then they move on to some other university, which they then trash. Um, but it, it has nothing to do with with I believe I, I don't. They, they had to say these things in order to get the position that they have in the first place. Right. So somehow there's a screening process, which is ensuring this incredible political conformity of senior administrators. They would like you to think that these are intellectual giants and they have all independently come up with these incredible ideas. So all of the chancellors and the president of the University of California filed an amicus brief in the Harvard case. Um, Harvard case has nothing to do with California, actually because we have Prop 209, but they were all all pro-Harvard uh, for that case. And they were screened for that someplace. Okay. Yeah. So they're not saying this is to benefit our students and junior faculty and things. They're not saying that? That That is what they're saying. That's just- That's what they're I, saying, okay. That is what they're saying, yes. Tell them, tell them that they are hurting every black kid with this because they are, basically educating them in a biodome so that when they leave, they'll be brittle, you know, and blow over. And if they disagree with that, tell them to go buy their white hoods. <laughs> okay, let me get, that's great. Um, Marty, I just want to go back to, to you. We've got lots of questions and we need to get those, uh, but just very quickly before we do, um, you know, I think there, there are important roles that trustees can play in terms of, uh, hiring senior administrators, especially university presidents and setting the terms for, you know, what sorts of qualifications are you looking for uh, and that sort of thing, uh, as well as, um, you know, board of trustees are in a position potentially to deal with uh, accreditation issues as well. Um, and I think you've had some experience with some of these things at UNC. Could you maybe just briefly, you know, uh, give us your thoughts on these two issues that, uh, that Abby in particular has raised today? Yeah, I mean, I think we're increasingly seeing accrediting bodies um, that, that people are using that as a weapon uh, to, to advocate for a position they'd like uh, the university to take. And so there's always this threat. Uh, sometimes it's, uh, you know, people calling in airstrikes on their own position, I think, with this approach, because they're, um, you will see people complain to an accreditor trying to threaten the accreditation of the university uh, just because they, they want what they want uh, done. And we've pushed back on that. We pushed back at the, um, at the federal level. Um, Congresswoman Virginia Fox has been very vocal on that issue. Uh, we pushed back at that directly. And, uh, you know, I've spoken with accreditors before myself and, and had discussions. And I, I think that you know, it's not always the accreditors here, it's the constituent institutions that are part of that accrediting body that then set these rules. So I would not necessarily blame the accrediting body administrators for some of these issues, but it's more the uh, constituent institutions that are uh, pushing for something. Okay, great. Um, all right, well, uh, we should probably open things up uh, to Q and A at this point, and uh, I'll hand it off to to Nick to field the questions. Absolutely. So, uh, Steve, you were absolutely right. We do have a lot of questions coming in, and uh, we will do our best to get to all of them. Uh, so, let's begin. <clears throat> uh, can uh, and this is open to anybody. Can you offer any? or any additional best practices to challenge those who appear to be opposed to open discourse? Well, well. Um, again, I would uh, make discourse, I mean, well, civil discourse, uh, debate, things like that, a systemic part of education and to model the benefits um, of, of doing this. Um, and to model or to show how it can fortify uh, students, not just on campus, but when they leave campus and go out into the world and have to sell their ideas in the marketplace of ideas and, and things like that, to show them the, the, the general benefit 
of uh, these kinds of activities. Uh, you can have campus groups and things like that if you want, right? You can have a debate series like I talked about before, but it has to be an embraced, an explicitly embraced part of any campus. I'll just jump in. One of the um, uh, models that I think we can all learn from and, and um, uh, gain from is the Braver Angels debates. Uh, I don't know if uh, how many trustees on the on the webinar are familiar, but Braver Angels is really growing a, a pretty large uh, reach in coming onto college campuses and modeling uh, civil discourse. And and I think you know should they continue to succeed and grow, we're going to have a hopefully a generation of of college students that are. Uh, enabled with the skill necessary to to uh, you know continue forth in their careers with with those skills, because as I said earlier, you know we're not we're not born with with debate skills. It's a skill that needs to be taught. Uh, and Braver Angels offers uh, a great platform for universities to use to 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 help teach the students. Okay, these are uh, great answers. Uh, just. For the, again, we have a lot of questions, so I'm just going to move right on if that's okay. Um, as a trustee who is apparently expected to be involved only nominally in the final steps of the tenure process, what can I do to protect intellectual diversity without micromanaging faculty promotion? So I would say, and I think this has arisen for for across uh, across the country for various trustees, your nominal duties are real duties. And if there's an issue with a tenure appointment, I, I, I think you have to read your duties as they're written. Um, and because they were put in there for a reason. And, and so I would encourage you to really look very carefully at these rubber stamps that you're you're expected to give out. And I do understand that essentially you are expected to give them out. Um, I think for me, the more the, the greater concern is the is the rubber stamps for, for administrative appointments, as I've said. But take them I would, seriously. I would wholeheartedly agree with that. I, I think the problem is, you know, the board of trustees or board of governors over the years has been viewed as a rubber stamp that the trustees are only there to just uh, uh, attend games and, you know, uh, be ceremonial and, and stamp a, an approval on everything. And when you start having discussion and debate on topics and you start questioning that, you will come under fire, but that's your job. And you know, I would say if a trustee isn't willing to, to jump in and tackle the tough work, then they probably shouldn't be on the, the board. Um, but you know, in terms of tenure, you know, I, I've been a, a longtime critic of the concept just because we don't have too many lifetime appointments on day one of a job and uh, other private sector uh, industry. So I, I do think there's a need to look for alternatives to that concept. Um, I definitely believe in protecting um, academic uh, freedom and freedom of expression, but I think we can do that in other ways without uh, necessarily handicapping the university and making it commit to a resource where there may not be demand for a particular um, class over time. Marty, I think that is is well said. It is the job of a trustee not to rubber stamp, but rather to understand and, and take action where action is needed. And, and, and Steve, I might suggest the a, a topic for a future webinar is on tenure. Because the way to not micromanage it is to understand it in its, you know, uh, why do we have it? Why is it important? And why do we now see, in many cases, universities going to one-year contracts and two-year contracts? Because it allows the university then to eliminate a professor who doesn't conform to a particular ideology. So tenure is important, and and I think I think trustees need to understand the, the, the good and the bad and the upside and the downside of, of uh, how tenured positions or contract positions are used to, to almost institutionalize this, this conformity. 
Okay. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Alrighty. So uh, this one actually addresses uh, a few of, uh, uh, this is actually a few questions in one. Uh, what would be a good alternative for university leadership to be cognizant of some of the difficulties which minority students, be they racial, ethnic, or religious minorities, may face without having to relent to uh, critical race theory or other narratives and creating biodomes on these students by limiting speech? Is there a way that university leadership can be compassionate without being dogmatic. How could this be done? I said earlier, uh, I, I use a term called defensive confidence. And again, what that is, is having enough uh, rhetorical savvy to be confident that you can go into a situation and defend your ideas. Uh, that's one of them, giving students the habits of mind that will help them in this society, make a line from those habits of mind to success in this society, right? I can read some habits of mind and then tell you how they've been interpreted. Curiosity, open-mindedness, engagement, creativity, persistence, responsibility, flexibility, metacognition, there are more. They've been called racist and white ways of knowing. Now, I think it's disempowering to not have the black students or the Latino students or any kind of mar mar uh, marginalized students acquire those skills. That's the travesty. That's disempowering. So give them those skills, give them the, uh, the, the necessary habits of mind to go out and, 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 and have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, that's that. Do not try to coddle them. You are not allowing them to grow. You're not allowing them to build fortitude. You're not allowing them to build experience, right? Um, you're allowing them, you're telling them it's okay to run away from a conversation. You're telling them it's okay to silence somebody when they say something you don't like, instead of saying something back to them, right? Um, that's the issue here. So this is kind of stifling the upward mobility of a lot of uh, marginal groups. Okay, uh, I think we have time for possibly one more question. Um, <clears throat> okay, as a strong believer in the necessity of free expression and intellectual diversity, I was wondering if you could address the threat that these values or, or the threat to these values that some state governments now pose. Uh, there's a caveat here. Uh, for example, uh, I recently read the various iterations of current Florida legislation about higher education. So um, I think that's a, a great question. And I do think uh, in Florida in particular that there has been swing, a swing back too far in the other direction. Uh, um, another organization that I'm a member of, the Academic Freedom Alliance in particular, has written objecting to some of that Florida legislation. And I think that this is a danger that is, when the legislature actually becomes involved in dictating what can and cannot be taught at the university uh, or discussed at the university, that's really a problem. That is an infringement on academic freedom. And I think we have to be very careful to make sure that we don't go in the other direction and start impinging on other people's opinions that we might not uh, agree with. So I think that's something that has to be watched very carefully. I'm sympathetic because even to the Florida legislation, just because things have gotten so bad where I am in California, I'd be sort of grateful for the legislature to step in. On the other hand, I would not want the legislature in California to step in and give any specifics about what can and cannot be taught or discussed at the university. I, I would chime in and say, I think, you know, obviously the people of the state uh, with the UNC system and our 17. Uh, schools should have a say in the university because they they own it. Um, that may be a little bit different than um, legislature that's applying to all schools, including private schools, and the discretion they may have. But I do think the people of the state and parents um, deserve a voice in the education process. Um, there's a there's a fine line you need to walk there, though, making sure you don't uh, infringe on other people's uh, freedoms as well. Great. Uh, so we are we have reached three o'clock. Um, 
for all of the panelists and Steve, would, would everybody like to offer a final word? Yeah, I'll offer an opportunity to any of our panelists if there's any final thoughts you had or anything that you didn't quite get a chance to address. I, I just want to say I'm so grateful that trustees are taking such an interest in this. And I, I, I'm not optimistic myself, but I'm more optimistic than I was an hour ago. So I appreciate that. I think sometimes, you know, it's a being a trustee, it's a part-time role. It, it can be uh, overwhelming, but, um, you know, I would encourage all the trustees on here to, to keep plugging away, chip at it. Sometimes these things just take a while and it'll take you a, a bit to get settled in and uh, you may voice an opinion and it may not be popular at that time, but, you know, keep at it and, uh, and you can affect real change. And maybe I'll just uh, close by adding that, of course, ACTA is is here to to work with trustees and to help trustees. And uh, you know, we certainly have a wealth of resources and are, are happy to talk with trustees who are interested in, in improving the conditions for free expression, and intellectual diversity on their campuses. Of course, you can consult the gold standard. Uh, we can provide uh, you know other resources as well as uh, you know talk to you about examples of what others have done, like Karen and Marty, but but other trustees elsewhere. Um, you know there there are uh, other people out there who are concerned about these things and, and doing things about them as well. So uh, we're certainly happy to provide any any help that we can and um, you know help to you know improve free expression at our universities across the country. And thanks to all our panelists. This has been um, really insightful and, and uh, hopefully really helpful to those of you who uh, joined us in the audience today. Uh, thank you to you also for, for listening in and thank for the you. questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.